Hey everybody, it's time for another video series idea I had a long time ago and never did because I wasn't vlogging back then, but now I am, so it's a good idea, so let's do it. We're going to play Crunchy Roulette. So Crunchyroll has a random button, this little piece, this little dice that says random under it, and uh, I've always thought it would be fun to do a game where I just click this dice until I get a show I've never seen before, and then watch it and talk about it on video, <clears throat> and just a way to to just blast through a bunch of shit I've never seen before. Oh God, why is that so hard to open? So we're gonna go ahead with my beer and my animus. And if you want to play this game, which I encourage you to do, or watch the episodes that I'm going to talk about, use my damn sponsor link. Don't use Jeff Thu Mother's Basement sponsor link, because he makes more money than me on it for some reason. Fuck you, Jeff. I don't know why you make more crunchy money than me. All right, let's click random and see what we get. Shin Koihime Muso Otome Taidan. I think this is, I think that's a second season. I don't think I want to try to do second seasons of shows, because if I haven't seen the first season, then that'll be especially confusing. And I have seen the first episode of the original Koehime Muso. This is the only one they have on here, though. Oh, Jesus, it started up. Let's see what, let's see if that's the original or not. Yeah, that seems to be a sequel, so let's, let's roll again. Blackjack Special. I guess I haven't seen the Blackjack Special, so let's check that out. Oh god, it's loud! Alright, so I just watched episode one of Blackjack Special on Crunchyroll, which apparently is a four episode series of TV specials that aired between 2003 and 2004, um, right before a 2004 full Blackjack anime adaptation happened. Um, which I guess is probably from the same team and just following off from the specials. I've never actually seen any of Blackjack. For those who don't know about it, Blackjack is one of Osamu Tezuka's uh, classic manga from probably, I don't know, when did the manga start? Let's find out real quick. It's an adaptation of Blackjack from 1973 to 1983 is when it ran. One of the longest running Osamu Tezuka mangas. Um... And most famous, and the thing about a lot of anime from the like uh, from the late '60s, early '70s, uh, or even the '80s, like a lot of them have a ton of different anime adaptations with weird chronologies. Because sometimes they're more like a reboot, and then sometimes they're more like a sequel, and then sometimes they're like both. And it can be hard to tell with some of these, like Fist of the North Star or uh, Mazinger or uh, Getter Robo. Or any of these like classic ones that keep coming back and having resurgences, it can be difficult to know like where to start or which ones are the best. Um, but these Jack Blackjack specials, this definitely seemed like it was intended that if you didn't know Blackjack, you could start here because it gives his backstory, uh, which is hilarious. That when he was a little kid, he's playing on the beach with his mom, and she doesn't notice until the last second that there's like a half buried sign that says. Uh, um, un unexploded bombs on this beach, and then he gets blown up. He gets put back together by doctors, and then he grows up to become a doctor. And he's like the greatest doctor in the world. And he's basically a superhero um, who can heal anybody or whatever. Um, but he's yeah, he's like a superhero doctor. Doesn't have much in the way of personality per se. Um, I've heard before that uh, Tezuka, because I believe he had studied to become a doctor, or maybe even was a doctor for a while, um, people often say that, like, Blackjack is his, like, vision of the the perfect doctor, um, who's just, like, always morally righteous and always, uh, you know, able to heal anything. And he travels around with this little lolly girl named Pinoco, uh, who's just, like, kind of, like, emotional because he's not because he's always like guarded then she expresses all of the things that the audience is meant to feel so she's sort of the art audience surrogate character um and so i've again never seen it until now and i'll say of this special that it's very corny but it's also like so over the top that it's really hilarious because it's like it's a it's a doctor drama it's about you know uh something happens to someone and it's like a question of whether blackjack can heal them and in this case it was a rich businessman his son 
um, gets into a car accident and is on the verge of death. And no doctor thinks that they can save him, but this guy's willing to pay any price to save uh, his son. And Blackjack's like, well, if you get me some someone else who I can give them uh, his body parts, then I can uh, bring him back, right? So this guy tries to fuck over some other kid who knew uh, his son in order to make him have to give his body uh, up to, to save him. And so the whole episode is kind of building up to, like, you know, Blackjack agrees he's going to do it. He's going to fuck over this other kid to give the parts to, to, the, to the businessman's son. And all you're thinking is, how is Blackjack going to fuck this guy over? Like, that's the whole episode is building up to. In what way will Blackjack fuck this guy over to make it so that, <laughs> so that uh, the kid doesn't have to uh, sacrifice his body to save the son? And it's, it's funny because I would definitely say, like, in comparison, it's it's funny to watch this as a follow up to Joker game and Gate because some of the things I complained about in those shows could apply to this one, except that it's not as annoying in the way it handles them. Like I was talking about in Joker game, how there's that episode where the whole thing is just a build up to how is this guy gonna escape? But there were only two options, or really one option, which was that something random was gonna happen and it was gonna get him out of there. Whereas in this show, all of it was a build up to what is Blackjack gonna do. To, sit, to to fuck this guy over, but, I, I, like, my mind was racing with the possibilities. Like, what could he possibly pull off to make this happen? And I really wanted to know because it did so much to, like, you know, with the setup to make me interested in how this was going to resolve, how he could fuck this guy over. Um, and I've read a lot of Frankenfran, and Frankenfran and is... Similarly, a doctor manga, except a really fucked up, uh, bizarre one, where oftentimes people will come to Fran with something they want fixed, and she'll turn them into some kind of horrible monster creature. Uh, or, you know, it, it's always like a monkey's paw type thing, where whatever they want, it's gonna be like a fucked up, warped version of that. So I was really wondering how far Blackjack was gonna go. Like, was he going to save the son and the other kid, was he going to find some way to, you know, not do any of that? And and in the end, he completely fucks over the guy. Because the son was already dead. Like, there was no way anyone was bringing it back. Spoilers, by the way. There's no way they could bring back the son. So instead, he just changes the other kid's face to look like the son. And then has that kid run away, so the dad thinks that his son has run away, and then changes his face back to what it originally was. And then gives the kid all the money that he got from the businessman to do the operation so that he can leave the country. So co just completely fucks over the businessman in every way. Didn't actually save his son at all. <laughs> and took all his money. And it was like, wow, he like really fucked that guy over, you know, like, that guy was just treated as outright no victory for him, the son is just dead, you know, because the son was, like, an asshole, so nobody liked him, so the whole time I was wondering, like, is Blackjack gonna be one of those guys who's, like, you know, every life is worth saving even if they're an asshole, but no, he, that kid's dead, you know, so, uh, it was pretty entertaining because it was so over the top, like, this show has the most bleak worldview, where, like, the, the businessman is able to, like, rig the entire, like, criminal justice system in order to let his son get off the hook and, uh, and get this other kid, like, killed. Because they did it through the courts. Like, he, he, he accuses this ki other kid of uh, having caused his son's death, and the penalty is that he has to give up his body to save the son, effectively killing him. Which is just ludicrous. And it's, like, it's so over the top. That ended up being entertaining. But it is very corny, and I will say that the music is bad. It's like, it kind of like, it's like MIDI music. It's like early, early, early electronic, like electronically produced music, but not like electronic music. Just like, you know, it's trying to sound like normal music, but made with like synth instruments and stuff. At least that's what it sounded like. Um, but it, it was like cringe inducing. The OP is hilarious because it's like a like an electronic beat and then a guitar solo and stuff over it but they just sound out of time with each other and it's really bad so the music is like hilariously terrible um it feels very 2003 anime like that switching to digital era of anime where 
Um, you know, things looked a little bit awkward, but I mean, a lot of it feels like it's just copying the manga directly. Like, I haven't read Blackjack, so I can't say for sure, but it felt very uh, much like Tezuka's aesthetic. I've read some of his manga, and it felt like that. Um, I think that some of the scenes that came off really corny in the anime could have come off less corny in the manga, or if they had adapted it a little bit differently and, like, made it feel more dramatic or over-the-top in, like, a, uh, in a way like, what's his name, the director of Death Note, like how he would have done it, um, could have worked for this. But, uh, overall, I, I kind of enjoyed it, and I wouldn't, there's only four episodes of this special, so I feel like I might as well finish it, so I might check out another episode or even watch all four, just so I can not have it as a random on hold or drop on my list, and, uh, you know, why not? So we'll see about that. Well, I ended up finishing that Blackjack special, and it was pretty fun. I'd give it a 6 out of 10. It had a decent variety of stories, which I wasn't expecting for, you know, just a four-episode thing. The second episode was more of a a quiet, almost slice-of-life episode with uh, the Doctor and Pinoco visiting this old lady, and uh, she has a sort of sob story where... You start to get the message of the show that, the, um, or start to get the idea that the message of this show is kind of that rich people are dicks, and um, Blackjack's thing is that he apparently charges like a billion yen for every operation he does. So he always finds himself in situations where it's like super high stakes or someone extremely rich is involved, which is sort of, I guess, you know, how they keep it exciting and also to make him this sort of a, uh, this. This heroic guy who sticks it to rich people by uh, forcing them to pay out the ass um, for their mistakes or for being shitty people. Episode 3 got, like, totally sci-fi. It was about a, a sci-fi that's op- or a hospital that's operated by robots and- or, like, an AI central intelligence that, that operates on all the patients. I don't know, like, how old this story is from the manga, but it still kind of held up as, like, a sci-fi story that didn't feel ridiculous by today's standards to too much of an extent. So I thought it was a... It was still a pretty interesting little AI story with a surprisingly positive take on the idea of robot doctors or AI doctors, which I guess uh, Tezuka was always sort of... Um, favorable of robots and artificial intelligence. He obviously wrote Astro Boy, one of his heroes, um, or one of the heroes he wrote, rather, is a is a robot, so that was pretty interesting. And then the last episode was a bit more of Blackjack's backstory and showing um, how he cannot deal with the idea of death and with, like, the idea of him, himself failing. And it is a little unresolved in the end. Like, it's a problem he still faces, that he doesn't know how to deal with the idea that he cannot stop death, which is great. I relate to that, and uh, I thought it was pretty cool that they didn't just resolve that flaw out of his character. So, it was a pretty good time. Um, maybe I'll check out more Blackjack in the future. I don't know. I don't know uh, what the best ones are. Um, I'm glad I started with this one, though, because it was such an easy watch. Just four episodes had a lot of the the backstory and, like, the character development for Blackjack gave a great idea of, like, who he is and what he's about. So, um, I would recommend that. If you want to get into Blackjack, look up the Blackjack special. It's pretty cool. Um, and I guess that means we gotta go back to Crunchyroll. Oh, by the way, I watched the, the other three episodes of that on fucking Kiss Anime because, you know, as much as I love Crunchyroll, fucking something about this site... It takes, like, an exceptional internet connection in order to, to, to work. Like, more so than any other streaming site, it really, like, is a load on your internet connection. And uh, and it, t it always takes forever to load the fucking videos. And you can't leave them buffering because if you leave a video open for too long on Crunchyroll, then it'll, um, it'll stop and you'll have to reload the page. So... It's a pain in the ass, so I ended up having to go to Kiss Anime because my internet's being shit right now. I don't know why. My internet's been shitty all day, so I had to watch it somewhere else. God damn it, Crunchyroll. Why does this happen? Why is it so hard to load your fucking videos? Wanna, I, want to, I want to believe in your service, but, you know, it's not always the best. All right, let's click this random button and see what we get. Gurren Lagan. Well, I've definitely seen that.
Battle Girls Time Paradox. I think that's just the English title for... Um, yeah, I've seen this show. I don't remember what the Japanese title is, but I've seen the first uh, episode of that before. So, random. Rene, I've seen the first episode of that. It's gonna take a while, guys. I watch a lot of anime. Magician's Academy. Oh, this is, um... Oh, what's the name of this show? It's another one where I, I've seen the first episode, but um, I only know it by the Japanese title. Princess Nine. I actually haven't seen the first episode of Princess Nine. Baseball anime from the late 90s that I know a lot of people are, are pretty into. So if it loads up, I'm going to go ahead and watch this. And if not, I'll go to a different website and watch it. It looks like it's loading up fine. Cool. Uh, so I'm gonna watch the first episode of Princess Nine and see how that goes. Okay, so Princess Nine was pretty okay. It was an enjoyable, super 90s sports, sort of shoujo-ish, but really it reminded me more of, like, classic sports anime, such as maybe, um, Ashtano Joe, or even, uh, Aim for the Ace or something. It has this very old-school, classical feel to it. In a way that uh, is interesting, because it came out in the late 90s, so it kind of feels old school even for that time. Like it, It's like double old school, because it feels old in the sense that it would have felt old at the time, but then also in the sense that you can clearly tell it's from the 90s. So it's like a double dose. Um, actually, what it reminds me of in comparison to modern anime, and actually what came to mind the most is, like, a studio trigger show. Like, it kind of reminded me of Space Patrol Luluko with the way that the main character acts and is portrayed and the way that it does these, um, these sort of throwback look to the character designs and stuff. I, if this show came out today, it would probably be a studio trigger show. Um, it's just got that kind of vibe to it. But it was pretty interesting. The character designs were odd. I like them, and especially in the ending theme, it, like, has a bunch of character art that looks really stellar. Um, I don't think the characters animate that well. Like, there's parts where, uh, they go for really thick outlines and, like, these cool-looking shots of characters doing stuff, and those look great. And then there's other times where it's not like that, and the characters look kind of weird and awkward because it doesn't feel like the designs are that good for animation but nonetheless the show has a very rustic feel i like the aesthetic of it overall even if it is weird sometimes and the story is about just a it's a sort of typical story about this very talented um pitcher this girl who's an extremely great pitcher um her father was a legendary pitcher who died in an accident 10 years ago and her mom runs an Odin store, and she plans to take it over in the, in the future, or to, to continue working with her mom. And what's what I like about this show, and about this character that interests me, is that she does not care about the fact that she's talented. She just wants to run this Odin store, and she's totally happy with that. Like, she doesn't have this, like, obligation feeling. That's just what she wants to do. It's everyone else who is recognizing her talent, who wants to use it for their own purposes and to, you know, to get her to play baseball, essentially. So, uh, it's interesting that the main people who are trying to motivate her are almost presented not, not so much as villains, but as, like, they're, they're not, they're not, like, in it for her. They're not, like, wanting her to become uh, a baseball player for her sake, it's more for their own sake that they want her to do this. So uh, I find that aspect interesting, and there's little hints of intrigue in some of the other characters that were introduced as well. Now, I will say that a lot of the dialogue in this show is overly exposition-driven and, like, too many characters, like, explaining something to someone that they should already know, like uh, the main character girl explaining to her like, long-time childhood friend that she's gonna inherit the Odin shop, and I'm like, he definitely already knows that, you know? There's a lot of little things like that, characters explaining things to them that they definitely would know, which is a little annoying, but it didn't bother me so much that it put me off, and overall, I like the ideas behind the story enough. I think it could make for a cool sports story, 
Um, and I'd be interested to watch more of it and maybe eventually finish it. I don't know about watching it right now since it is 26 episodes and I'm not like super hype to watch it, but, um, I'm glad I finally got to see some of what it's like because I have heard of this show forever <laughs> and I've uh, never given it a chance. Alrighty, let's go and do one more show before we end this episode of Crunchy Roulette. I'm going to hit this random button, see what we get. Pretty Cure Episode 1. I have seen that before. Random Upote Episode 1. I don't think I finished the first episode of this, but I did read uh, like a lot of the manga because I read the manga before they made an anime, and I remember thinking that the anime did not capture to me what was good about the manga, and I just kind of thought it sucked, so I didn't finish it. Uh, so I'm going to count that as watched just because I'm already familiar with it. Click again. Uh, La Maison en Petite Cubes, which was the uh, short film that won Best Animated Short at the Academy Awards of uh, 2009. Have already seen that. Funny that I got that because I just saw that on Davu's uh, My Anime List. Nogi Zaka Haruka no Himitsu Season 2. I've seen uh, episodes of Season 1, so. Twin Angel Twinkle Paradise. I don't think I watched the anime version of this. I saw the OVA of Twin Angel back in the day, uh, which was from the same director who later did um, Railgun and Iron-Blooded Orphans recently and Toradora. I think it's the same guy. Yeah. And Anohana. And uh, he did this OVA and then they made a full series out of it. And I remember hearing that it was shitty. Maybe I did watch half the first episode. Uh, I'm gonna say I'm too familiar with it. Random again. Decapo 3. Do I need to see Decapo uh, 1 and 2 to understand Decapo 3? I don't think I do, because I think the Decapos are like spiritual sequels to each other, not so much direct sequels. And this is the only one they have on Crunch. It doesn't like. It doesn't show all the different decapos on here. So I'm going to find out if I can watch this as the first entry. Okay, so from what I've gathered, Decapo 2 takes place 50 years after Decapo 1, and Decapo 3 takes place 20 years after Decapo 2. So I'm thinking that they probably don't have a lot of the same characters, and I can probably watch the first episode of Decapo 3 without knowing shit about the rest of the Decapo series. I've never seen any of it. Um, I've been aware of it for a long time, and I'm very curious as to how it's popular enough that it's had anime adaptations of, like, all three games. I think it has. Um, so I need to know what is so special about Decapo that they keep making more of it. Um, which maybe I won't figure that out from watching Decapo 3 and I'll still have to watch the other two, but we might as well give it a shot. Well, there's not much to say about the Capo 3 other than that I got exactly what I expected. It was a perfectly generic uh, visual novel adaptation. Um, there was a guy in a club with four... Four girls? Was it five? Four girls? Uh, who all want to suck his dick. They all, they all, they, all they want is to fuck him. That's their whole personality, all their motivation. They, they're, they're kind of indistinguishable. Like, as I was watching this, I couldn't tell, like, one girl was calling him Onisan, and then another one was, like, playing a game with him or something, and I started to, like, not be sure which one was which, because all their personalities are the same. You know, it's actually funny, because there's no tsundere in here, which is kind of refreshing in a way, but every character was dere dere. They all just want, all they care about is the main guy. They're all super nice to him, they're flirting with him constantly, and of course he is a brick fucking wall who doesn't realize that the girls are flirting with him. Um, they all make a wish on this cherry tree uh, that all the girls wish that he will, um, that they'll end up with him, and he wishes that they can continue l with these happy times forever, him and this group of friends, because I, I guess that's, yeah, that's what he wants. Um, 
and other than that, there's there's nothing to it. The characters are like in a newspaper club, and they're gonna they're gonna write an article or something. It's it, this was like the hardest thing to pay attention to. I was more invested in the sandwich I was eating while watching it than I was in the show itself. The cinematography of this show really, really wants you to know that these girls have boobs. Like, it would... <laughs> the camera would pan in such a way where it would, like, show a girl talking, and it would show her face and then show her boobs, and then show the next girl's face and then show her boobs. Like, uh... Here's what she looks like. Here's her rack. And th you can pick which one you like the most because you know what their boobs are like. You know, that's how it felt. There was something really disturbing about that. It was like, like, it felt like, I mean, I know this is because it's a visual novel game. So at the start, you would meet all the girls and then choose like a route you want to go down. But in the context of an anime... It feels like if you're at like it, like you're at the marketplace for for hot girls or something like like you're like you're sizing up like fruits to decide which one you want to buy like that's the way that it felt I guess that's what objectification is in a very literal sense um, yeah it felt uh, weird and boring very boring this is one of those shows that just had me like uh, yeah or I could watch porn. You know, like, that's how I felt about it. So I kind of feel bad if I end Crunchy Roulette episode one on such a on such a downer uh, note. So I'm going to keep going for one more. Random. I got Classroom Crisis. I've seen the first episode of that. Genshiken season two. I have seen that. Madaka Box season one. I did watch episode one of this back when it came out, though I don't remember it at all. And I would like to check it out someday. Um... Seito Kai Mo Season 2. I've seen Episode 1 of Season 1. Joker. I don't think I've seen this. Yeah, this is a Kaito Joker. I have not seen this, and I have had it recommended to me before, or just had people um, saying that they enjoyed it. So I'm going to check it out! Alright, well, I watched the first episode of Kaito Joker. It was okay, but I don't think I'll watch any more of it. It's sort of this bright, poppy, fun kids show about uh, a phantom thief, this, like, ludicrously overpowered um, thief kid who goes around and steals shit. He's got a, you know, inspector who's always chasing him down. The usual kind of stuff. The Lupin the Third um, type thing or Kaito Saint Tail, for one from the 90s that I um, watched the first episode of fairly recently. And, uh... This really had the feeling of, like, something that would have been on the Fox box or on Kids WB in, like, 2004. Like, this is a show that I would definitely have watched when I was, like, 12. I don't know if I would have, like, been into it or anything, but it's certainly something that, that I would have seen on TV uh, had it come out back then. Um, and I thought it was a fun time, but it's the kind of thing where it's very goofy... But it's not really funny. It doesn't really have jokes, per se. There was a couple moments that made me snicker a little bit. But uh, it's not super funny. And then the the uh, the heists that he pulls, because Joker is so ludicrously overpowered, where he has, like, all these items that he has that make him... that, that are, like, almost supernatural in their abilities. Um, he has, like... He's always ten steps ahead of everybody, and there's no dramatic tension to it at all because he can just at any time pull something out of his ass that'll get him out of the situation or, or help him to steal something. Well, I was going on a ramble about how I thought the ending of the episode didn't make any sense, but then as I was explaining it, I started to realize that it made sense and that I was wrong. And I don't know how I messed up, <laughs> but I, I, I tricked myself. Anyways... Um, I think this, this show seems like it could be a fun time, but, uh, I'd much rather watch Loop on the Third, which I have, like, hundreds of episodes and movies that I could watch, um, if I just want to see some goofy, wacky, uh, antics with Phantom Thieves, or Kaito Saint Tail, um, which is, like, the magical girl equivalent of the same thing, and it's less, like, ridiculously over the top. Uh, I will say, though, that the purple-haired police girl is waifu tier. She's pretty great. So, all right. 
that wraps up this episode of Crunchy Roulette. Uh, I would like to do this again sometime. And if you do this, if you decide to try it out, let me know how it goes. Because I think it would be a fun game uh, to try out. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.